We are live. Well, we're not live. <laughs> we are alive. We are alive. <laughs> <laughs> and the mood has been set. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. It's Melanie Yazi from RPH. Um, Elena and I are here. We were supposed to do a live Ask Me Anything um, Merciless Indian Savages edition. <laughs> supposed to happen two days ago. Uh, I apologize that fell through, um, entirely because of me. And we'll talk a little bit here at the beginning before we answer the, the questions that folks submitted for the ask me anything. Um, but instead of doing a live recording, we're just doing a regular recording, uh, still merciless Indian savages edition, um, just 48 hours behind schedule. I can just hop into it and let people know <laughs> why we're doing this instead of that. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize to all of our listeners who wanted to join live. And I also want to apologize to my comrades, to Elena, you know, and to Justine and to Sina. Um, we had all been making these plans and had advertised it. And then I changed the plan literally at the last minute. Um, my comrade, Demetrius Johnson, Red Nation comrade, uh, kind of convinced me to go to Rapid City. It's a mini Luzahan. Um, as many people know, Indian Collective had organized a very important action, um, a march and a rally against police violence um, on the 4th of July. And I was mostly like, that's a really far drive. I don't know if I have the energy for it, but we ended up doing it anyway. You know, it's like an eight or nine hour drive each way um, from Minnesota Mokoche and the Twin Cities in Minnesota, but um, drove out there on Monday. And then um, was asked, I was asked to help out with security for the march. And so I ended up doing that. And then the action went on much longer than anticipated and just cut right into the time we were supposed to be doing the AMA. And so I was like, I'm literally still out here on the street <laughs> with people in front of um, the Pennington County Courthouse and the jail. Um, I can't make it. And so that's why we had to reschedule this. Um, just to let folks know that that action was really incredible. I mean, I don't know if people remember like three years ago back in 2020. So on July 4th of 2020, um, Indian Collective and other relatives um, formed a blockade up in the Black Hills because Trump, then President Donald Trump, uh, in a direct provocation, um, kind of a clap back to the movement, if folks remember what was going on in the summer of 2020, obviously it was like the, George, the uprising that happened in the wake of George Floyd's murder um, by the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, Native people were also mobilizing heavily during that summer. Um, and so, yeah, Donald Trump wanted to come to Mount Rushmore, you know, to the heart of America, um, really to antagonize the movement. Obviously, there's been incredible mobilization by Ochati Shakoi people for the return of the Black Hills um, land back. And so I feel like ever since that action in 2020, um, which I think went viral, I think everyone in Turtle Island was watching what was going down. Um, Every 4th of July, you know, what goes on in Miniluzahan, uh, what Indian Collective and other grassroots um, indigenous liberation organizations are doing on that day, it's kind of become like a flagship action. I think for lots of us who are in the movement um, to convene and to really come together in a spirit of solidarity and strength in, in the heart of the Black Hills, you know, which is sacred to many <laughs> indigenous nations um, to throw down on behalf of our people um, to throw down on behalf of land back. And so that's what happened. Um, so that's where I was. Uh, it was important to protect the people. Um, I was a marshal, mostly just answering questions for folks and guiding people. But, uh, you know, the police department um, had been spreading rumors um, in the preceding weeks claiming that um, the merciless Indian savages were going to descend on downtown Rapid City. We're going to like light things on fire and like loot. It was like eerily empty. Um, that day, usually Rapid City, because it's like near Mount Rushmore and they have all those dumb president statues in the downtown corridor, like on all those corners. Um, it's usually like a hot spot for, you know, like white people to descend um, on the 4th of July. And so it was like strangely quiet um, that day, that evening, you know, with fireworks and stuff, people were out and about. But the downtown was clear and later found out that um, the Rapid City Police Department had been scolded by the Department of Justice, by the feds the day before, into being on their best behavior the day of the march. Um, the reason why the march happened, um, I didn't know these statistics. The statistics of incarceration and police killings 
um, of Native people in South Dakota are egregious. It's like s somewhere between like um, 80 to 90 percent of all people who are incarcerated, I, either in Pennington County or the state of South Dakota, are Native people. Um, I forgot last year, I think, was the highest number of police killings of Native people in recent history. I mean, it's bad. Um, and then I think just the day prior to the march, this would have been on Monday, July 3rd, Nick Tilson, who is the president and CEO of Indian Collective, was slapped with even more charges, just these like bogus charges. Um, I think of like intimidation of a police officer and unlawful use of a cell phone. <laughs> and she, I, I mean, it's like fucked up, you know, but I'm laughing because like cops are such losers. You know, they here they got like, they got chewed out by the by a uh, big papa feds and <laughs> DOJ like you better not cause problems you know and but what then did, what did Nick Wilson do to intimidate the cops did he just like show up yeah I mean I... <laughs> he did okay. nothing he did nothing he did, he did he nothing just showed up and and that's that's in <laughs> enough intimidation I I love that like okay no they're just trying to harass and like drain Indian collectives resources through like legal fees and. Um, obviously still, you know, they're all still pee pee hearted from Standing Rock. And I think from, <laughs> you know, like the fact that Indian Collective even exists in Rapid City, um, yep. there were all of these like white bystanders who were like locked in their pickup, their big pickup trucks with their tinted <laughs> windows. Like they were just all parked and just like staring at everyone, you know, um, as the march went by and uh, just acting like real afraid. <laughs> real afraid <laughs> it's like yay right yeah. but also no one was there to like you know be any some way i mean stop killing native people and give the land back and uh it'll be good <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a two, two pretty easy you know simple requests uh-huh stop killing native people and land back um i i watched um part of the video um, that Indian Col Collective had posted. And I was just kind of smiling to myself and, and like, like super happy on the 4th of July um, doing not much else. Don't, don't celebrate. Um, but did make fry bread the day before. Um, but when, when, uh, when Melanie um, texted to say that she was, you know, doing this, this is important work, like people on the ground come first. And as a Native liberation organization, as an organization used to um, being on the ground and being involved in actions, that's, that's just a hands down, people on the ground come first, safety, security. But then I was looking at this video um, later on the evening and, and like blown away the banner that was dropped. I was like, whoa, wait a minute that's like really big and really long. I went like the whole city block. I mean, it was huge. And, and so I was just asking Melanie before we started recording, like they must've had a drone to take the footage of it. I mean, it's huge. It's, it was amazing. Check it out. I, I think they had two drones. So they had a drone. So first of all, like hats off to Indian collective and their tactical media team as well as all of the people who collaborated on the art on the ground, including making that epic banner. That banner was as wide as a city street and it was 220 feet long. And they unfolded that thing seamlessly. Like it must have taken like dozens and dozens of hours to create that banner. And the thing is like one of the things I wanted to say, um, besides the incredible media that they did, the tactical media team for Indian Collective, they had a drone over the immediate era area where we where the banner, I mean, it wasn't really a banner drop, but it was like a banner unveiling. And the banner said, no killer cops on stolen land. So that was, and everyone was wearing t-shirts. They handed out t-shirts that said that to everyone too. I mean, we all had pickets also with that phrase on it, but they had someone up on a hill with um, some other folks from tactical media who had a drone and were doing larger aerial shots of kind of the entire downtown Rapid City area. Um, so you can see, you can see it from two angles. The cops also had their drone <laughs> up or whatever. Um, cause where we stopped was right where, um, a lot of people are detained in the county jail actually. And because what is it like eight or nine out of 10 of those people are native, most likely Ocheti Shakoi, we were standing right there and they could see us outside of the little slits, the little slits that count for windows. 
in their their cells. And I think the most powerful thing, I didn't even notice it at first, Demetrius had to point it out to me. If you stopped and you could listen kind of in between the speeches and the the things that were happening um, on the megaphone and on, on, on the loudspeakers, you could hear them knocking and tapping on the windows just to let us know, you know, that they appreciated the fact that we were there. Um, there were at times when people who were speaking were speaking directly to them. And I hope and I think that they could hear um, the love, you know, and the support that was coming from the crowd. Um, obviously, we were surrounded by cops, but it was just like a very, I, I got tears in my eyes, um, you know, seeing that. And then there were also um, almost all of them were, I think, Lakota women were in a cage. I think it was like the smoke area outside of one of the other facilities. It must also be some sort of detention facility but they were just south of where the crowd was. I mean, like literally 30, 40 feet away from where the banner was and where the speakers were. And they were recording on their phones and they were yelling and hooting and they were like totally there in the action with us, even though there was, they were literally in a cage. It was an actual outdoor cage um, separating them from the rest of the crowd, but they were obviously part of that. And again, just kudos to Indian Collective for such, first of all, a well-organized, very safe, action but such like a strategically like badass action to stop right there where all of the rel our incarcerated relatives could see us to be able to speak directly to them but then also to really like throw down and speak directly to the power um directly to power i.e the police department um so yeah it was really beautiful there were like fashy people um kind of on the periphery on the blocks directly north and south of us and, you know, you just never know um, because the cops are so violent and so intensely racist towards um, Ochati Shakoi people in Rapid City. You know, like you just it can be quite unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen in those situations. But as far as we were concerned and, you know, the Native people in Indian Collective, we were just there to, like, speak truth to power, to let people tell their stories, to let incarcerated relatives know that we love them and that we're there for them and we're still going to defend them. Um and there were a lot of elders and there were a lot of children, lots of babies, you know, lots of families who were there. Um, so, yeah, all, all in all, it was powerful. It was beautiful. And I was just really honored, you know, for the Red Nation to be a part of it. One other thing I wanted to say, um, I know I'm going on and on, but it was a pretty big deal. This, this action was a pretty big deal. Um, I saw people from all over Turtle Island at that action on Tuesday. So the Red Nation was there. Demetrius and I were representing the Red Nation. Also saw people from the Little Earth Protectors, um, Rachel Thunder, you know, who did the walk for Peltier last fall. Um, they all came from Minneapolis, from Twin Cities too. So there was a block of people who came from um, Minnesota Makoche to show up. Um, pipe carriers and staff carriers and bundle carriers were all there to protect the people. Um, I saw folks from the Peltier Defense Committee who were there. Um, there were people who were very prominent leaders at Standing Rock who were there. Um, and actually one of the people who helped to create the banner, there was also this cute little like worm bus <laughs> that these kids were inside of that they obviously had constructed that was like a bus, a, a human bus, like a human centipede bus, but it was like the outside looked like a bus and they had facts about the school to prison pipeline a um, hundred percent of the expulsions in schools, either in Rapid City or Pennington County, are Native students. Um, all the people who are expelled are Native students, and so they had statistics about the school-to-prison pipeline for Native youth on the side of the bus. But the artwork was incredible, is basically what I'm saying. And there was one relative, um, I don't know how to gender this relative, uh, who came up to me right before the march started and was just like, you know, talking to me. And I was like, "Oh, are you from here?" And they're like, "No, I'm from a." Uh, Oak Flat, like they were from the Apache Stronghold movement. And like they had a denim jacket on, but they showed their shirt and it was like the Protect Oak Flat. And I was like, damn, this is awesome. We got people from like the most badass, longstanding struggles of the last decade descending here on this day to be together in solidarity. So it really was like, it really was a big deal. And I think it was important for the Red Nation to be there. So. That's what I was doing instead. <laughs> the AMA. <laughs> Super cool. Yep. Well, um, now that I've gone on and on for 15 minutes about that, um, 
Let's, uh, let's answer some questions. Let's do it. Do you want to go in order? You want to go first? I can go first. I can answer this one really quickly because I don't actually have a lot to say about it because I don't know. Okay. But I just wanted to highlight because I think it was a good question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so Craig Bellows, thanks for this question, uh, lives in Las Vegas, New Mexico, and works with land grant heirs um, through their job as a middle school English teacher. And Craig said, I would like to do work bringing in indigenous history in regards to my land grant and Asequia culture curriculum. I found Roxanne Donbar Ortiz's Roots of Resistance and David Correa's Properties of Violence and an Enemy Such as This to be a really good course about tenure history, I'm assuming land tenure history in the state, that highlights First People's centrality in the myriad waves of colonialism. Unfortunately, these texts are pretty high level for the middle it says the middle age, I think you might have meant the middle school age. Um, can you point me in the direction of texts that might be more accessible to this age range? Uh, not really, to be honest, especially, but maybe Elena, you can help this, um, help with this, um, particularly when it comes to like um, a an indigenous critique of like the coloniality of the land grant and a secular system in New Mexico. Um, there is a high school version of Indigenous People's History of the United States that is also by Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. I'm not really sure if she talks specifically about land grants, but that might be maybe like a good introductory um, piece uh, before you kind of go into the more difficult technical texts that you listed, also by um, Roxanne and David Correa. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight this question. I apologize for not having better like specific answers about resources for middle school aged folks. But I just really applaud your effort, Craig, um, to offer an indigenous analysis of land grants because like almost nobody does that <laughs> in New Mexico. Do you know of any? I don't. I mean, I would, have, I would have also said Roxanne's um, high school version of um, indigenous people's history of the United States. I, I actually don't know of any um, books on land grants or Asakia culture for anything other than adults it's it's a very specific um topic so i don't know of anyone who, who actually attempts to teach that to um middle schoolers but it's yeah like melanie said i applaud that that is a um quite a an ambitious undertaking um because there's a lot of history about it. i mean i grew up in northern new mexico so um you know the land grants and the well um the stories of Reyes Lopez Tijerina and um the the original um land grant um fights in in northern northern New Mexico and the Alianza um the shootout at um the courthouse in Tierra Maria um I grew up with those stories um, Roberto Mondragon, who was one of the Alianza members, later became Lieutenant Governor of New Mexico. Um, he was a friend of my dad's. So, I mean, I remember all those people and I remember the movement and I have a number of um, friends also who work, um, who are mayor domos and work in the Asequia. I think those stories in a lot of ways are best told from people. Like their the oral tradition around those histories, um, my suggestion would be reach out to people and find find out if you can get someone to come and talk to your middle schoolers. That would be my recommendation. You know what? Yeah, that's a really good suggestion. Yeah. Well, thanks for your question, Craig. I hope that helps to point you in the right direction, but Again, I really just wanted to highlight that because I applaud your effort. I think that's great. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Elena, you want to? Sure. I'm going to um, read a question from Manolo. Um, what would be the best way to explain to someone who is used to celebrating the 4th of July, the Red Nation's position on the holiday and what it represents? Also, what is the distinction from an indigenous perspective between Thanksgiving and the 4th of July in terms of both understanding and observance? Um, and this is an interesting question because it, to me, the, the, the first thing I thought of when I read it was it highlights um, how little education is actually um, done in 
this country around the the truth of both of these of these holidays. Um, so I don't know that I can speak for the entire Red Nation, but I'm going to speak for myself and say that like Thanksgiving is a made up settler fantasy um, of some you know, beautiful feasts where the Wampanoags welcomed the dirty, stinking, unwashed pilgrims. Um, Cause you know, those people did not bathe, right? Um, they came over on the Mayflower, um, didn't bathe the whole time they were on that boat. And then they got to uh, Plymouth Rock and they didn't bathe here either because they're, they were religious fundamentalists and they didn't believe in bathing. So this is, this is what y'all are celebrating. Um, you're celebrating a bunch of stinky, unwashed people who landed um, off the coast of Massachusetts and had no clue how to live. They didn't know how to farm. They didn't know how to hunt. They almost starved to death the first winter. Um, they were, and I don't know, I, I will admit to not knowing the in-depth history of, of this, but I know that they were saved by Tisquantum, who is better known in history as Squanto, who was kidnapped and sold into slavery um, by the English and managed to escape and come back to his home country, his homeland. Um, and he either took pity on these um, poor stinky pilgrims or um, there was something that he he wanted maybe to know how long they were going to stay, but actually helped teach them how to, um, how to grow crops and how to live. And they celebrated the first harvest with, with these, these people. Um, that's the myth, um, about Thanksgiving. Um, it's really nothing to celebrate for native people, for red nation people in particular, we call it no thanks, no giving because, it's literally the beginning of genocide on, on our homelands across Turtle Island, starting in the East and, and moving all the way to the West. Um, that's my understanding of the history of Thanksgiving and the idea that um, what children are taught to, you know, make little, and, and, you know, I still saw this when my kids were little, little paper headdresses with paper feathers to represent the Indians and turkeys and um and this great idea of of feasting feasting is indigenous um there's no question about that but the lie that created that holiday is is super offensive and just i don't know why would you want to celebrate those people like seriously they stunk just um, celebrating bad hygiene just celebrating <laughs> bad hygiene <laughs> Yeah, they didn't wash. They were really stinky. Um, Fourth of July. Now, Fourth of July is 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 worse in a way, in that it it, it actually celebrates the the Second Continental Congress um, ratification of the Declaration of Independence, which is why we are called today merciless Indian savages, um, and it it was the creation of the fascist settler state that we are talking about on this holiday. And what um, I think Melanie really literally just laid out what happened in, in Rapid City, why no killer cops, um, that uh, all of that fascist settler state started with the Declaration of Independence and the description of Native people as as merciless Indian savages. Um, so why would we celebrate that? Like why why would we want to recognize that day when it really just legitimized the genocide that had already been happening and that continued to happen? Um, you know, from sea to shining shining sea and manifest destiny and all that other crap. Um, that people celebrate because they don't understand the true history of this country. So um, my 
Uh, thanks to Manolo for asking this question. And if you really want to understand the truth about the founding of this colonial project, then read indigenous authors. So read um, Ned Blackhawk, um, read um, native authors who are cutting through all the bullshit and actually um, having um, real conversations about the founding of this so-called nation. And then, you know, you don't have to ask for an indigenous person's perspective on these holidays. As a human being, you can talk about your own feelings about these holidays because their fantasies and their, their lies that have been told since the 1700s, they're not real and you should know the truth. And if you know the truth, you don't have to ask us. You can just say it yourself. Yeah. Listening to what you're just saying, Elena, it came to mind like, uh, Thanksgiving, I feel like Thanksgiving is about the good Indians and the 4th of July is about the bad Indians, right? Because the language of merciless Indian savages, right? That is attached to the Declaration of Independence, which is what's celebrated on July 4th. But then the notion of like the hospitable, you know, uh, Indians who welcomed the pilgrims, um, which is what Thanksgiving celebrates, like we hug or whatever the fuck we're supposed to be doing. But one is like the vanquishing, um, or like the conquering of indigenous people of the merciless Indian savage. And the other one is like how we made friends and like how we live peacefully. We coexist peacefully today. So they yeah. both serve the same function, right? They both reinforce these stereotypes of the good Indian and the bad Indian. Um, but nevertheless, they're both just about um, naturalizing and normalizing, you know, settler claims to dispossessed land um, and hegemony uh, behind yeah. U.S. nationalism. So they're both very and patriotic holidays. They are. Right. And they're both, you know, the, the, and they're both, you know, designated by presidents of the United States who are, are men. So they're also very, very um, patriotic, but also very patriarchal. Yeah. I mean, like one of the biggest football games of the year happens on Thanksgiving day. Right. Man sport. Yep. It's like the national pastime. Also, you know, the movement to abolish racist anti-Indian imagery <laughs> in football, as well as like uh, anti-black racism. <laughs> right. Um, happens in the arena and the theater of, of American football. So also has to do with patriotism. I mean, sorry, patriarchy. Um, I wanted to say, uh, you know, when we were rounding a corner during the march, uh, in downtown Rapid City, there was a church on the corner and on purpose, right? So the drum was singing, singing indigenous stuff, <laughs> you know, Ochatishakoi music and songs. It was so powerful. It was like thundering and like reverberating off the buildings, you know, as we were moving through downtown and a church very purposefully turned their church bells as loud as they could get them. And they played for the, from Sea to Shining Sea. What is that song even called? I don't know. And then they also played the national anthem to drown out the sound. It's America the Beautiful. America the Beautiful. That's America. what it's called. Yep. Yeah. And like for a moment I was irritated, but then I was just like, you know what? This ain't about you. Like you're trying to, you guys, y'all are pee-pee hearted. Like this is Lakota <laughs> land, pure and simple. Like these are just like Lakota people just being Lakota and just like reclaiming this space. They don't need to apologize. They don't need to ask permission. And I, as a person, I'm just here to like protect the people and to be in solidarity. So we got the power right now. You know it. Wah. <laughs> you <Yep. know>? Wah. <laughs> <laughs> you big babies. <laughs> Bunch of losers. Just do your colorful loud bangy ejaculations in the sky and leave us the fuck alone that is also an indigenous perspective on the fourth of july ejaculations in the sky that is correct <laughs> colorful ejaculations in the sky you know and it's done by men because when it rains they fall apart which we all know you know white men fall apart in the rain because they, just they don't wash you know they're afraid of water like whatever <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Um, shall we move on? Let's move on. I think we. <laughs> and we milked that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. all right so uh tim moore asked a question uh what are native nations doing to promote the preservation of the colorado and other rivers what can allies do to support that effort and what will it take for the settler culture to start thinking of the colorado colorado river as a spirit that deserves to exist in her own right rather than treated as another thing to subdue and exploit um so to the first question, what are Native nations doing to promote preservation of the Colorado River? There, um, so Tim, there are two specific things that you can look at. Um, the first is the Colorado, Colorado River Basin Tribal Coalition. Um, and I'm going to, their website is waterandtribes.org. And I'm just going to read their description really quickly for you. So several tribal leaders have come together to create the Colorado River Basin Tribal Coalition. Um, the intent uh, is one to create a place where leaders from all 30 sovereign tribes in the basin can come together, exchange information and build consensus on shared interests Two, advance a whole basin approach to water management in the Colorado River system. Um, well, I guess there's two main reasons why they do this. And so the reason why the Colorado River Basin Tribal Coalition was established was um, historically the 1920, 1922 uh, Colorado River Compact completely excluded any tribal input. And most of the way that um, water law has been handled by states like Arizona um, historically has also excluded tribal voices. Um, this is, you know, this is mostly because tribal nations along the Colorado River in the Colorado River Basin, basin particularly the lower Colorado River Basin, um, actually potentially have like huge claims to water rights. Uh, that really threatens like capitalist and settler interests, um, particularly development interests um, and kind of industrial agriculture interests um, from major cities and places in Southern California, like the Imperial Valley Water District. Um, and so there's been like a very orchestrated effort um, on the part of settler politicians, as well as um, business owners in places like California and Nevada um, and Arizona to keep tribes out of negotiations around the allocation and the preservation of the Colorado River. So um, some years ago, the Colorado, the, all of these, the tribes that have claims um, and, and are around the Colorado River uh, came together to, you know, create almost like a power block <laughs> to demand um, participation in the in those, those negotiations about water claims to the Colorado River. One other thing that's happening, um, I don't really know much about this, it's called the 10 tribes partnership. Um, and they are much more about um, seeing the Colorado, Colorado River as sacred. Um, they say the Colorado River is sacred, water is life. The peoples are the keepers of the river and we take full responsibility to care for the river. Um, and the, their homepage says, so begins the vision of tribes that live and rely on the Colorado River and have united to protect its cultural and ecological resources. So, um, I said this on a previous episode of RPH. Um, I do a lot of work on water rights. I've researched extensively um, my own nation, the Navajo Nation's relationship with the Colorado River um, and the history of water rights adjudication when it comes to the Colorado River and the Navajo Nation. Um, that preservation, I'm speaking to your first question and then what allies can do to support that effort, that the number one thing that allies can do to help is to promote and advocate for the most generous and kind of largest allocation of water rights to tribal nations like the Navajo Nation. The more water that indigenous, these 30 sovereign indigenous nations are able to lay claim to, I mean, I know this is like a possessive property rights kind of system, but nevertheless, through law, the more of the actual water of the Colorado River that these 30 indigenous sovereign nations can lay claim to, the more that water is going to be preserved and conserved um, because there will be a cultural perspective. There will be respect for the sacredness of that life vein for the entire region. Um, and honestly, those tribes are simply just not, they're just not going to use as much water um, as the capitalist interests uh, that have dispossessed those tribes of their full claims to those, to the water of the Colorado river historically. So promote that. And then that would also be, I think a really important, almost like land back 
um, or like a decolonization effort because the the history of um, dispossession in that region has been carried out very straightforwardly through, uh, you know, I called it the unlimited limitations when it comes to making sure that indigenous nations have the least amount of water like possible uh, compared to these other entities that have claims to Colorado River water. So dispossession has happened in relationship to land, but it's also happened in relationship to water because obviously you can't live if you don't have water. Um, so it's just another tactic to kind of displace and to permanently remove indigenous people from their homelands. And in terms of your last question of what will it take for settler culture to think of the river as a spirit in their own right? I don't know the end of capitalism. <laughs> I guess, you know, I mean, there would have to be a fundamental um, I think paradigm shift from thinking about the land as um, a possession to thinking about the land and water as a relative. And indigenous people have never stopped um, thinking in that paradigm um, and still enact that through natural law, um, which bolsters like how we govern ourselves uh, as nations. But I don't know what that would take for settler culture. You should just give the water back to tribal nations and then follow our lead, I guess. Yep. And start by burning all the churches because <laughs> it's Christianity that puts human beings over nature and, and has that hierarchical structure that native nations never had. Um, it's actually the, the three patriarchal religions that are all equally um, as, as hierarchical. And, um, you know, like the Bible says, the God gave man dominion over the animals. And that's absolutely not true, you know, and, and no native person would ever say anything like that. Like we're, we're all relatives. We're all connected. We're, we're, we need one another to survive and we depend on one another um, to keep the balance in the world. So that's and my two cents. Speaking of patriarchal religions, um, right. Uh, there's been a lot written about, the way that uh, the land was conceived as feminine, um, mm -hmm. kind of like within the doctrine of discovery or like the, the framework of manifest destiny. And therefore it was like rapeable and conquerable, right? Because it was feminized in that way. And so even the language of conquest obviously is a hyper-masculine language. Um, so obviously having a different indigenous feminist, <laughs> you know, paradigm an approach to the land, um, again, seeing it as a relative or as a relation and having a relationship of stewardship and caretaking and respect. Um, obviously, that would also be a paradigm shift that would need to happen in addition to not seeing it as a possession, kind of overturning the colonial relation. You know, I know these are big picture things, but isn't that what we're striving for? <laughs> isn't that what decolonization describes? So that's right. Um, Okay. Shall we move forward? Yeah. So I have a question from Aram Ronaldo Corian. Um, I loved your gal's comment about finding more inspiration in stories of resiliency. Um, and thank you. You love that too. Um, my queerness and Palestinianness is also gravitating more towards stories of folks who persevere and share these joys with our other community members. Besides the Sweet James Beard Award to the Indigenous Chef in Rhode Island, are there any other awards, award ceremonies, awardsy institutions, you know, that have been giving sparkly awards to our talented artivist comrades around the Western and or Eastern hemispheres? So I think it's interesting that, um, so they mentioned Sherry Pocknett in Rhode Island, who won the James Beard Award for for um, Best Chef. And then, of course, um, Sean Sherman, um, the sous chef, who won for his restaurant, um, Awamni. And, um, and it's interesting that that food is, is an acceptable thing for um, Native people to be elevated and awarded for. Um, but in terms of, of art, um, cause of course I come from the Indian art capital of the world. Um, native artists are a separate category. Um, and, um, and native writers, um, only win awards if they're, 
um, books are within a genre that's viewed as acceptable to um, the larger literary world. And one of the things that Red Media is trying to do is actively change that. And um, we had a conversation with Ramona Emerson, who has written this fantastic book called Shudder um, on a podcast uh, a few months ago. And um, we, we uh, did a podcast on the book where Melanie and I talked about it. And then we did a podcast with Ramona that unfortunately was, um, was not aired because the, the audio, there was a problem with the audio. We're going to redo that and talk to her. And I hope to be able to steer her back to talking about what she talked about um, in the prior episode, which was her great um, delight in seeing native writers, mm -hmm. young native writers, um, writing about all sorts of subjects and topics that had not been really um, written about before, fantasies and science fiction and horror and mysteries. And so all I can say, Aram, is that I hope someday that we're going to see awards, Pulitzer Prizes for writers, um, indigenous writers, native writers, who break out of that um, that sort of stereotypical um, native writing spirituality or or trauma, trauma um, or historical, and there have been a few um, books written about you know s sports, basketball players, hockey players, but like let's let's really encourage young writers to write about whatever it is that they want to whatever makes their world mm -hmm. um whatever gives them passion whatever inspires them and if it's fantasy if it's science fiction whatever um and i would like to see um awards for for um native writers and native artists that break out of those stereotypes and um, the other thing that I wanted to mention too, because um, crying, you know, in my coffee in the morning, I found out that um, Reservation Dogs is, this is their third and final season. And so of course we've done three episodes with Reservation Dogs, one of them with some of the writers, with a couple of the writers. And um, the first year, I think the show got such critical acclaim and blew people out of the water. And of course, native people were just, you know, thrilled to have some, um, you know, some mainstream television show that actually spoke to us, but it didn't really get any awards. And <laughs> second season, um, now that uh, they've announced that this is their third and final season, maybe, Maybe the Emmys will show them some love this year. I don't know. I'm hoping, keep my fingers crossed because I think they all deserve it. I think the writers deserve it. And it would show um, that, you know, this, this show had broad appeal, um, that it is part of not only um, native culture and native art, but actually can appeal to, to um, mainstream audiences i'd love to see a native actors have never really been been um awarded either i mean graham green was up for an award for um for dances with woofs and uh he didn't win hello um but even so that was a film that was you know listen to the red nation podcast um <laughs> That was a fairly stereotypical character that he played. Um, not saying he was, he didn't do a great job. He was fabulous. He is fabulous. He's one of the OGs. Yay, Graham Greene. But like, I would love to see people on Reservation Dogs get awards for what they have contributed to, um, to television. The young actors, the writers for sure, the producers, you know, everybody in that show deserves an award. So are there any? Not that I know of. Should there be some? Hell yeah. Keep your fingers crossed. Let's let's hope that 
that uh, we see a lot more than just um, chefs being awarded and not to take anything away from chefs because I, chefs are great. Food is great. <laughs> I remember. So this question made me remember a passing comment during a meeting in red media, maybe two years ago that like, wouldn't it be cool if red media gave out awards for indigenous writing or like indigenous media, but I'm assuming like stuff that's political, um, since that's, you know, kind of our bread and butter as an organization. And so then I was thinking about that actually the last few days, like, what if we gave out some awards? Cause like <laughs> native people who produce political content like never get anything. <laughs> so, we should we should do a whole podcast with with uh, red media awards. I mean, who are we to decide? You know, who Heck, should deserve an award? But nevertheless, like there isn't really an entity that's just like here was the best like a uh, tactical media production of the year. You know, here was the best. I don't know, like you know what I'm saying. Here's the best podcast episode about, you know, something badass <laughs> yep. that happened in the movement in 2023. So anyway, this made me think about that. Goals. Yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, shall we move on to yep. another question? So this question is from River Andres. Uh, do you know of any tribes offering refuge? to transgender and gender expansive folks from surrounding border towns as anti-trans bills continue to pop up in every single state. I also wonder about real rent as the Duwamish are doing in Seattle. And if there are any other tribes, nations engaging that strategy, uh, specifically any of the folks whose land this is, the Peoria, Miami, Ochetishakoi, Kaskaskia, Kikapua, Poalia, Piankisha. Uh, so in answer to the first question, um, if tribes are offering refuge um, in kind of in the wake of all of these anti-trans bills that are being passed, I don't know of any indigenous nations that are doing that. But the reason why I wanted to highlight this question, River, is because it's it's actually like a very productive provocation for a campaign to get indigenous nations to do that. Um, I remember, was it in 2017, there was a lot of dialogue and discourse within the indigenous movement about at that time to offer and to open up um, indigenous nations for sanctuary for um, relative migrant relatives because um, ICE was on the hunt. Do you guys remember when all this was happening? So it was like the sanctuary city movement that was going on. And so I remember like Mayor Tim Keller, uh, was he mayor at the time? Whoever was mayor of Albuquerque at the time, as well as other major American cities were passing bills to become sanctuary space spaces. Um, you know, migrant folks were fleeing into churches and other religious institutions to claim sanctuary. Um, and that this was, you know, kind of like an interesting movement in an effort uh, to push back against ICE um, and the criminalization of immigration in the United States. And I don't remember if any indigenous nations did actually pass um, sanctuary bills at that time, but this kind of reminds me of the discourse in that moment, where it's like, wow, we could actually, um, we could actually enact a really robust, um, strong form of sovereignty uh, by by offering sanctuary. You know, really kind of pushing back against the overreach of the of the feds of the United States government. And this also makes me feel like that would be a similar kind of push. But I have not heard anyone talking about that. So I appreciate you bringing this up because I actually think it would be a campaign worth pursuing. Um, and in terms of your second question about real rent, uh, there are settler land taxes that are happening in other cities um, in the United States. Albuquerque has something, uh, Standing Up for Racial Justice, which is an ally run organization, anti-racist organization has been running something called Honor Native Land Tax in Albuquerque for gosh, maybe like almost two years. Um, and so I don't think it's the same model as real rent um, that that folks are doing, uh, the Duwamish, the Duwamish Nation is doing in Seattle, but it's generating income for native organizations like the Red Nation, for example. Um, and you know, it's like a, it's a form of reparations, like in the form of um, a tax. 
and it's voluntary. My understanding is it's a voluntary tax, but something very similar to this uh, was implemented and kind of um, uh, kind of like ahead of its time in the Bay Area. It was either in Oakland or San Francisco. And with the money that folks, I don't know if it was allies who did this or if it was like the Ohlone folks or if it was like a coalition of people implemented something similar to a settler land tax. And I believe with some of those proceeds, they were able to purchase land um, for the Ohlone uh, in that area. And so it's a very like, it's, I don't know how common these kind of settler land taxes are in major U.S. cities, but there are places where there is like pretty significant income being generated that is going directly into real land back kind of scenarios um, for indigenous people, like buying land back and being able to establish, who knows? I mean, indigenous people can do whatever they want <laughs> with their land on the land back. Um, so that is happening. I don't know if it's happening where you're at. I doubt it. Um, but yeah, it is happening in other major U.S. cities. Cool. Cool. That's all I got to say about that. Okay. Do we have time for one more? Uh, where are we at? Uh, yeah, I think we do. Okay. Um, I have a question from Quinn Rupp. I found the Red Power episodes discussing tourism in Santa Fe covering a topic I haven't heard much of elsewhere. Its parallels to Hawaii are so clear, yet I hadn't seen it before. Are there more materials out there that discuss the tourism and or art gallery industry in Santa Fe y'all recommend? So um, I haven't seen, so I, I, I would recommend something written by a native person um, critiquing the tourism industry in New Mexico, but there isn't anything that has been written as far as I know. That is um, wild. It, it's, it is wild and it needs to be done so badly. Like the closest thing I have ever seen um, is a book by a guy named Chris Wilson called The Myth of Santa Fe. And I think the, and yeah, The Myth of Santa Fe. And um, he talks fairly honestly about the creation of you know, the Adobe Disneyland and how the architecture and all that was really created by a group of, of wealthy white men from the East. And we've talked a lot about this in the Red Nation, both around the Entrada protest um, and um, the the other um, toppling of monuments, uh, racist monuments in and around Northern New Mexico. And we've talked a lot about really this creation of the myth of Santa Fe um, the cultural cannibalism and, and all of that. And the, that episode um, that we did with, with our comrade Ua, um, who's Kanaka Mali was, was fabulous because um, just what they've done to Hawaii is, um, is tragic. And, and the same thing has been done to, to Santa Fe. It's a different a little bit of a different story here um, because a lot of native people in and around Santa Fe and Albuquerque make their living um, from um, tourism and make their living not in the service industry, which is low paying and, um, and you have to deal with shit asses, but like through art. And art has become um, a, a major income producer for Native people. And it, it works because people do it in their own homes, on their own time. They are still available for cultural um, events and um, can still take care of their, um, their families and their communities. And, and it has worked um, for Native nations in the Southwest um, to to have this um, sort of symbiotic relationship with, with tourism. Um, but it's also created a level of, of cultural, cultural commodification and really fake, like, I don't want to say this 
in a way that is insulting to to relatives, but um, the kind of of pottery and other um, artistic things that that people put out are they were strictly conceived of and created for the consumer market. They have nothing to do with real, honest, um, you know, traditional culture. They were done strictly to make a living and people have every right to make a living as they, as they can. So I'm not critiquing that, but, but people are buying, you know, they're, they're, they're buying pieces of native culture and they're taking them all home and they think they're really cool because now they've got, you know, part of the native spirit of Santa Fe or whatever the hell people believe. Um, but it has impacted our cultures in our communities to an extent that people are now, you know, it's like we are not human. We are just there for tourists. And so that was a long kind of detoured answer to that question, but I would love to have a native person write a book on the impact of tourism um, in, in the Southwest. I would love to, to see someone stand up and, and, and really go into um, how tourism from the mid 1800s has changed Northern New Mexico and has, you know, really basically change the trajectory of native peoples and, and, and art and all of that. I think it would be a great um, dissertation for someone to do, but it's not going to be me. So calling all academic young Pueblo people or Diné people or patch people, let's do it. Somebody write a book. So this is interesting um, because uh, I wanted to answer maybe one more question, but it totally dovetails off of this one. So Matt Sale asked, I, I apologize if I pronounced your last name wrong, Matt, but how should we think about combining power with the labor movement? Specifically, labor's resurgence should be linked to indigenous causes. And, you know, like the whole critique of the, like you said, the commodification of indigenous culture that's an issue of labor. That's about labor. Like indigenous artisans are workers, even though maybe we don't think about them as workers. And so how would a, la an anal a labor analysis and developing a politics around class and around labor help us to unlock, you know, a strategy for dismantling the larger kind of economic practice, um, right, of the commodification of culture, um, which obviously would tack, which would really you know, take on tourism um, in a place like New Mexico from a political perspective. So, I mean, I think we need to understand it historically, like as, as a history of indigenous labor in New Mexico, but also like politically, what do we do about that as a labor issue? Um, and I was also thinking some other things. Um, first of all, I think we talked about this maybe in our like year in review episode in December for 2022, but we noted on RPH several months ago that the labor movement, particularly last year, was like the most there were the most profound developments in the movement in Turtle Island happened through labor struggle last year. It was actually remarkable to see the number of strikes, you know, um, and just like the powerful, large scale labor mobilizations that were happening, which was honestly was quite unexpected for me, but it was really beautiful to witness. Um, but I, I think Matt is right that we haven't really had much of an analysis, um, you know, I mean, obviously people are just busy with other things about how indigenous struggle relates to kind of the uptick on um, the resurgence of the labor struggle. And I do know, you know, in the Red Deal, which I published in 2021, that we do think about, you know, labor and land back together. So for example, when um, Just Transition, which is, you know, when we're talking, we're in an era of climate change, and like it's really dominated by this conversation or this um, kind of attention being paid by the movement with the transition from dirty energy to clean energy. And that just transition is about how do we create new jobs in a clean energy a world where clean energy jobs are available, where we're transitioning to clean energy jobs. Um, and so you're not just shutting down kind of dirty energy 
industries that employ a lot of workers and then they're out of work and you're not providing an alternative for them, but you're able to transition them out of those jobs into new jobs that are about clean energy. Now, I mean, yes, the just transition is an important perspective, but when we think about just transition from an indigenous perspective, something that we bring up in the Red Deal is that there's so much pollution, right, from resource extraction, which has really destroyed a lot of the, the land that currently, a lot of indigenous land, land in reservations, land held in trust, um, treaty land, ancestral homelands. And so cleaning up that land, like land reclamation projects re would require a lot of labor. And so in the Red Deal, we kind of theorize and talk about just transition um, where as like a land back kind of strategy where we're employing and providing jobs for lots of indigenous workers, new jobs, but also jobs for indigenous workers who are working for like coal, you know, or working for like uranium or working for natural gas, but then they're able to transition into land reclamation jobs where they're cleaning up the land um, from all of the pollution and the devastation from resource extraction. So I think that that's one way in which the Red Nation has talked about, we've never done this campaign. I mean, this is just something we talked about in the Red Deal about how you can combine the labor movement with like an indigenous land back struggle. Um, but obviously, you know, the bread and butter of the Red Nation is in border towns and uh, how thinking about um, organizing working class native people, most of whom probably work in the service industry, but also most of whom are artists who work from home and are exploited in like pawn shops or when they have to sell at trading posts. And so then how do we tackle that relationship um, that is defined by exploitation and extraction from a labor rights or like a labor justice perspective? I think that that's compelling um, and it's definitely something worth thinking more about because I feel like that would be a pretty successful campaign. This is also making me think about doing more research and I actually don't know which sectors of the economy employ the most native people, or like which sectors attract native people. I mean, we all know unemployment rates on the res are really, really fucking high, right? We also know like a lot of native people are incarcerated. They're probably working while they're incarcerated, but they're probably not counted as workers. And we also know that the labor of social reproduction, like mothering and caretaking and running homes also is not compensated and usually isn't thought of as labor or work. So I think there's a lot of labor and work that indigenous people are actually performing that probably isn't even counted as work or as labor. So I don't know, this is like a multi-pronged thing that's going through my head. Like we need to kind of like recast what we even think of as indigenous labor. Um, we definitely need to tie like indigenous labor struggle to like land back and indigenous land struggle. Um, but then also we need to have a very strong class consciousness, I think. Um, in border towns. And that might be a really powerful approach to developing um, a strategy or a campaign or like a politics around it. But I don't have any answers, but your question just made me think a lot about the issue. And I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's it. We're at about an hour. Um, yeah. I think we're good. Anything else you want thank to add, you. Elena? No, thank you for all the questions. Sorry we didn't get to more, um, but uh, keep them coming. We we love to get questions and we love to be engaged with people and know that you're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Heck yeah. Um, yeah, who cares about the 4th of July? <laughs> decolonization land back all day every day that's what i think that's right that's, that's right my, that's my final comment well we'll be back where we are doing lots of interviews with cool people we got a lot of episodes coming up so you'll be hearing a lot more from rph as the summer continues to unfold thank you again for supporting if you know of anyone else who wants to support um direct them towards our patreon you know lowest level of membership is two dollars a month uh yeah thanks for listening everyone we'll be back soon